Hi there, welcome. I think we will get going. So thank you for joining us this afternoon to our webinar on innovation MD. And in the next little while, myself and my colleague Stan Poffe will be sharing with you some of the thinking we have around how large incumbents can learn from successful disruptors. My name's Erica Van Leeuwen. I'm the Managing Partner of Insights Consulting in Australia based in the Sydney office. And I'm here this afternoon with my colleague Stan Poffe. I'll be talking through the first bit around our first passion point on innovation and then Stan will be joining me. So let's talk about innovation. <clears throat> and this really is a call to action and very much a passion of my own for Australia. We know the numbers are in that innovation in Australia is far below the OECD average. And companies that invest in innovation are more successful and more profitable and have steeper growth. So it's a challenge and it's something that we really need to think about. How can we take on innovation more strongly? And importantly, for many of our clients who are large incumbents, how can they act like more like these agile disruptors who are coming into the market? But let's start with some great stories on innovation. Dyson is a brand that's well loved in Australia and well known. And interestingly, James Dyson got his idea way back in 1978. He was frustrated by the fact that his vacuum cleaner would lose suction. He took it apart and he realised the problem was that parts were getting caught in the, in the bag. And he was so frustrated about this that he spent five years and built 5,127 prototypes before he launched the G-Force. And he launched the G-Force, interestingly, in a test market in Japan. He sold it at a premium price, 2,000 US dollars. And it became a product of desire in Japan at this point in time. It was the premium product, it was a product everybody wanted. And for James Dyson, this was a product that really set him up. After selling in Japan for a couple of years, he had enough funds to set up his company, the Dyson Company. <coughs> And from there, he set off to invest and build his next goal, which was 100% suction 100% of the time. He was there about to build the Dyson that you and I all know and love and use in Australia today. And now I want to introduce you to another guy. This guy's name's Michael Dubin. Some of you might have seen this, but his story is definitely worth knowing about. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of dollarshaveclub.com. What is dollarshaveclub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and ten blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. <laughs> Looking good, pop up! Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are going to ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors. We're also making new jobs. Alejandra, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are dollarshaveclub.com and the party is on. So there we have Mike. He had 4,500 US dollars. He had a frustration, which he actually shared at a party with a friend in 2012. And a couple of months later, after sharing his frustration, which was all around, why is it so complicated? Why is there so much choice? Why do I, why is it locked up? Why is it so hard to buy? Just utter single frustration. $4,500, he registered dollarshave.com and with his money created that video, which he then put onto YouTube. With one hour of launching that video on YouTube, he had 12,000 sales. And within a few months, he had 16% of the market online in the US, really giving the large incumbents something to think about. So this, these two stories are great stories about innovators, but, but Mike's is probably a little bit closer to what we're talking about today. He has an idea, something he experiences, he's focused on it and he just goes and does it. Why can't we all be more like that? Why can't, why can't we do that today in our large companies? 
Well, lots of people do have a passion for launching things and maybe you've got a passion, you're sitting there and you're listening today to find out how can you take on PepsiCo and Coca-Cola? Lots of people are trying it and there's plenty of ways to help you do it. For instance, Jorge Olsen and Carlos Lopez, they've written a book to help you do it and they'll tell you everything about the beverage industry. They'll tell you how to build a product, how to package a product and then you'll te teach you how to do your sales and distribution. You see, today it's a lot easier. Um, books are available, um, the technology's there, and people who are really focused on that one goal can go after it hard, and they can, they can really build a bit of traction. So my question for you, if you're out there wanting to become a beverage CEO using that book, how long is it gonna take you to launch your new beverage? The answer is a very short 39 days. And this is really cha challenging for large people that we work for, large companies, because bureaucracies with their processes really struggle to keep up with this rapid change around them. 39 days is fast for a large company and it's worrying large companies. This is our client Elaine from Danone and she can see that these young, fast, focused startups, they are the weak point, they are their Achilles heel. They are the things that are nipping away at your market share in many different segments that ultimately soften the growth and reduce the bottom line. Let's take a look at Procter & Gamble. These are all of the private companies who are tapping at their heels across their brand portfolio. And this is very hard for a large company to stay on top of, and it does soften the growth and eat the bottom line. So what do you do? Well, if you can't beat them, one strategy clearly is to buy them. And that's what Unilever did. For $1 billion, they bought Dollar Shave Club in 2016. Not only did they buy Dollar Shave Club, they bought a company with a brilliant online distribution methodology and a database of customers. But it's not that simple. Buying a company doesn't necessarily mean that you're able to change the culture and the approach to innovation in your company. Often acquired companies sit on the fringes of the main company, unable to really impact the internal culture and the processes used for innovation. So look, if you can buy them, go and do it. I encourage you, it's, it's a great strategy. But if you can't buy them, if the right companies are not available, if the funds aren't there, what you can do is borrow and think about what are the things they're doing that we can bring into our practice. Well, in 2018, Stephen Denning wrote his book, The Age of Agile. And in The Age of Agile, he talks about the things that large companies need to be trying to do to bring agility into their innovation practice, into their decision-making process. And there's three parts to this. Small teams, bringing in the customer, the consumer to the center of those teams and building networks within companies. But this is easier said than done. I'm sure all of you have heard about innovation boot camps. Agile working. <clears throat> this is a shot here of ING's Innovation Bootcamp, where they bring 1800 ideas together from their ING employees, working on five strategic pillars and ultimately bring them together for a short period of time with mentors. And at the end of this process, eight finalists get 15 minutes to pitch their ideas. Now, surely this would work. And I'm sure you've all been involved in scrums, design thinking programs, agile thinking, incubator labs. There's one really big but with all of these agile approaches, and it's a big one. It's called a scrum but, because the data is in and it says that 70% of scrum implementations fail. Why would that be? Well, it's when large companies think that they can run an innovation hackathon week and then take those ideas and bump them into a process which is still quite traditional. Definitely worth trying, but be realistic and realise that it's possible you might only save a couple of weeks or a couple of months, because once those ideas hit a traditional process, they then start slowing down and we're now running way over our 39 days to launch our beverage brand. So this brings us to our story. We could buy them if we've got money and they're available, we could try and be more like them. We can talk about being agile, but be aware it's it's way more than just running an innovation week or, or having a scrum because ultimately we may not save that much more time. 
the heart of our story is how can we just be more like them? And we think the way to be more like them is to adopt into your entire process three key things. Friction is about really getting to the insight, really working off an insight, understanding the true insight, understanding where the customer is having their challenge. And then it's about having passion and implementation in how you put that through the business. It's not about seeing it as something that needs to be done. It's about having the strength and the, the focus to be able to bring that idea to life with passion across the business. And then thirdly, have the guts to pilot early. Don't try and build the perfect product and test it until it's perfect before you launch. This is going to take way too long in the current market that we're involved in. Have the, the focus and the guts to pilot early and fast and learn quickly. So these are the three things we think are really important to bring innovation into large incumbents. And the next part of what we're going to share with you is talking about how we can bring these three important focus points or DNA of, income, of innovation into your company. So let's talk about friction. What we saw in each one of our innovation stories is a passion around a frustration. James Dyson was frustrated about losing suction on his vacuum cleaner. He experienced it himself and he really looked at it in a fresh way and was challenging himself to solve that problem. As I said earlier, five years, 5,127 prototypes later, he was still trying to solve that problem. Another great story is Nova Covington. She also experienced a, a problem and she says it here in this statement, I started my company to solve a problem. What could be more emotional than having a child who's allergic to all of the products on the market? Nova was so frustrated by this and thankfully she had a husband who was a chemist that she went down to a basement and started experimenting. She couldn't find the products on market <coughs> that she was looking for. After some period of time, she managed to find a solution using mineral based products. And she's now stocked in 25,000 stores across the US and Canada. Excuse me. So both of these innovators had a powerful reason and a friction that they were trying to solve. We all use the word insight, it's in our name, but it needs to be very carefully thought about. It needs to be a deep and true insight. It needs to be something that's relevant. It needs to be something that you recognize when you see it. And when you see it, you need to think, wow, that's a different way of looking at that. And importantly, there needs to be emotion. There has to be a desire to make the change if you're going to have the impact across the business that you mean, that you need. And these three things together, when deeply understood and focused on, will give you the impetus and the way forward to drive the change and bring the innovation to life. But for most companies, they don't experience the people working in the company, people in your marketing team, your sales team, <clears throat> your R&D team, they, they're not experiencing this friction point or this challenge the way consumers are. So a good way of thinking about this is really to think about the Japanese way of going to the real place or Gemba. It's really only when you're in that place, as Mike Dubin was, as Nova Covington was, or as our, as our innovators have shown us, it's really only when you're there that you can see a new way forward. When you experience the challenge, then you can start and think about how can I solve the problem? So it's very important to get to that real place, to experience that problem. One way we often do it is with our mobile first technology using our square. Here you can see our moderator is posting a naive challenge to our consumers saying, I have a friend, Frank, he's really not um, that experienced in shaving and he really wants to understand how to shave. In putting this challenge out to our community members using their mobile phone, they're able to give us detail, images and share with us every step in the process. Do they wet the blade first? What do they do when they nick themselves? In this way, we can immerse ourselves in what is going on in our consumers' lives. And this is very important. Some years back, way back in 2014, we ran a square for a bunch of millennials and we were intrigued by where we thought the future of financial transactions was going. We were very surprised at what we found out. In fact, looking back at this piece of work where the insight really was how much millennials love their on the go lifestyle and how much the payment systems at that stage did not fit into this. 
and, and the challenges. So why couldn't payment systems fit more seamlessly into their lives? Well, that was six years ago, and today we see how much that category has changed and how strong and real that insight was. So connecting with consumers in their place in a 360 degree way is very much a way to get forward on insights and understand where they're going in your category. Another client that we've worked with is Durrell. They manufacture strollers under the brand name of Quinny. And in this instance, Durrell, we're really trying to understand what's going on with millennial consumers in cities across the world. Millennials living in built up urban environments. What should we be doing with them? So they chose to immerse with them, again, using a digital platform to understand what's going on in their lives. Let's see what they found out. When the wind blows through the window and the sun goes down all over the city, over rooftops, on to next stops, through the south way down where everything's gritty. have a great insight that evolved in this project. Millennial parents love their city. They think it offers their kids opportunities, but once those children are on board, it really changes how they're able to be mobile in that city and getting out that front door is a real challenge. This became an insight that inspired an innovation platform for Quinny. First off, pretty exciting one. The longboard stroller, hmm, maybe a bit risky potentially, got plenty of design awards, but probably a bit too far out. But then you can see how far we can stretch an insight like this when it starts to impact every way we think about our consumer. Here on their website, it's not just about the age of the child, it's also about where you're living, how big is your living environment, how much public transport do you use, and when you're out and about, are you active or are you more passive in that activity? So we can see here how this connection with this cons these consumers build an insight that allowed Quinny to really lift off on a strong innovation program. And once we have that strong innovation program, as our innovators did, often working with a mono insight so strong that they could continue to bring many ideas to market office. What we often see with our clients though, is that they approach insights thinking, well, I need to tick the insight off and I need a lot. What we really need to do is think, how strong is my insight? and think about validating those insights. How relevant is my insight? How different is my insight? How much strength is it giving me moving forward? And this is what we do always now with Heineken when we're working on their innovation program. Since 2011, all their innovation insights have been tested prior to going into concepts. And what we find is that by testing the insight, the concepts are stronger by 15 to 20% when they have a validated insight than when they don't. So let's not just think about ticking off our insights and building as many as we can. Let's think about building true insights from deep immersion with our consumers. And let's think about testing those insights even before we get them into concepts. And once we do, even when you've got that insight, what often happens is it goes into a PowerPoint deck, we present it to the team, we say, this is our insight, this is what we're innovating off. That's really hard. And that's a long way from what our innovators were doing. 
our innovators had a strong insight that they'd experienced. So activating those insights across the business is absolutely critical because it's only when they're understood, it's only when they're experienced that the team across the business can try and problem solve and creatively come up with innovative solutions to the challenges posed by the insight. I'd like, I don't know if you've seen this one. This is a really fun example from a, um, a Belgian company who were manufacturing and designing women's lingerie. And they really wanted to make sure all of their employees understood what that meant for their customers. The question that comes back is, how can you as a man know what it is to wear a big cup mat? Te dragen. Je maakt lingerie voor een grote cupmaat, maar je weet niet waarover het gaat. En we hebben een ongelooflijke race aan marketingtechnieken om dat te kunnen. Maar er is maar één manier om als man te beseffen wat het is om een e-cup te dragen. En dat is een e-cup dragen. Daarom lanceren wij de internationale e-cup day voor mannen. Ik krijg vaak te horen, ja, dat moet leuk werken zijn met al die modellen, die posters van halfnaakte vrouwen. Maar ik kan u zeggen, mannen staan er ook niet stil bij wat het betekent om een e te laten doen. Mannen kijken misschien graag naar een e-cup, maar dat is niet de essentie van een lingeriebedrijf. Mannen zien er alleen maar het aangename van. Want zo'n e-cup, laten we duidelijk zijn, dat kan toch een kilo tot anderhalve kilo wegen per vorst. En dat is niet weinig. Dat doet pijn in de nek, dat doet pijn aan de rug. Ja, zo is het niet. Wees maar eens die vrouw. Draag die borsten maar eens de hele dag met je mee. Dus daarvoor heb je een goede ondersteuning nodig. Door een goede BH voelt een vrouw zich niet alleen fysiek beter, ze voelt zich gewoon aantrekkelijk. Een goede ondersteuning is belangrijk. Iedereen bij Prima Donna weet dat. So what a great story about getting everybody to really understand the experience of what it's like for their customer. Here's another one that we did for Unilever in the US in this instance, and this is about helping employees who were working on a sustainability project understand how consumers store their food. On the left hand side, we can see how the Unilever sustainability team were storing their food. Amazing inventory control, use of, of food cooked the night before for lunch, everything in containers, planned ahead, very, very nice. On the right hand side, we have our consumers whose management of, of food in their fridges and cabinets was pretty messy and very, very different. So here it's important, every step of this journey is important from the point of view as getting to the insights. And as important as getting to great insights is making sure the whole business understands and can experience what the insights are about. Because unless they can, unless you can activate them within your business, you can't take them on that journey and think along and come up with these creative solutions that we need to solve for customers. For the next part of our story on Innovation Envy, I'm going to slide over here and my colleague Sten is going to talk with you. Hi, thanks Erica. Um, next chapter that we will be talking about is passion. And Erica already mentioned how important it is to activate your insights. So not just finding them and validating them, but also activating them and making sure that people within your organization who are not the consumer themselves actually are passionate about solving that friction. Um, and Erica already in the first chapter also talked about being able to buy or steal ideas. And you can steal ideas. You can potentially even steal insights. But what you cannot steal from startup companies or competitors is that passion, that passion for execution and the passion to solve the friction. What we see too often um, in bigger organizations is that a concept throughout the innovation funnel is almost approached as a relay race. And in the best case example, it is like this picture. It's a golden baton that gets passed on from the insights team to the marketing team to the R&D team and so on. But unfortunately, what we see a lot is that it's actually garbage that gets, gets passed along, rather than a real good insight that gets protected along the way. 
So what we really try to make sure, what we try to convince our clients of, is that there is at least one person that really sits with the concept throughout the whole innovation funnel and protects the insight throughout that whole journey. Because too often it is the whole art of insight writing and concept writing is passed on to an intern or someone is doing that very quickly in between other jobs, sometimes even done by someone externally. Of course, you can imagine that in that case, the friction or the passion to solve that friction is not really protected along the way. So creating that passion throughout the journey is one thing. But next to that, and many of you will recognize this, we have to admit that 99.9% 90, .9 of the world's smartest people are simply not working for our companies. And I'm pretty sure everyone in the audience who've tried to organize an internal ideation workshop uh, before, it is really hard to find the people that can really think outside of the box and get them around the table. In the best case scenario, you might have one or two co colleagues that are really good at it, but often the rest of the people might not be the really out of the box thinkers. Doesn't mean like in the quote here that they're not smart people, but they might not be the right person to ideate. And a framework that we often use is that if you look at 100 people, then you have 90 people that are really good at validating. These people are perfect, to link back to Erica's uh, initial uh, chapter, really good to observe them and see where the friction points are. They're also really good at the end of the funnel to tell you whether an idea is good or not. So they're really good at validating, telling you, yes, I like this, no, I don't like this, you can optimize it in this way, and so on. But don't ask these people to come up with new ideas. So 90% of people we believe are really good at validating. Next to that, you have nine people out of 100 that are good at curating. Typically people in insights functions, people in marketing functions, really good at connecting the dots and creating a strategy based on that. So really good at curation. In an ideation flow, typically the people that are sitting, like I was just saying, the people that are writing the concept, connecting the dots that they're seeing from the inciting phase and creating a strategy to move forward. So really good at curating and developing strategies. And that leaves us with only one person out of 100. One person that is really good at creating, thinking really outside of the box, not just coming up with low hanging fruit or bringing old ideas back to the table, something we often see in ideation workshops. So that 1%, how can you reach them? How can you bring them into your innovation funnel? How we do it is uh, we tap into our proprietary panel, ICA. It's a, a global community, you could say, of creators, really out of the box thinkers, or the one percenters, like I just explained. This is a group of over 300,000 people globally that participate in contests, so a competition. Um, we start with a briefing based on, of course, on a really good insight that is created by observing our 90% that is then crafted into a briefing, including the strategy that we get from our 9% our curators. And then finally, that briefing gets sent to the 1%, the ICA community to come up with really new ideas. And when we're talking new ideas, we're not just talking products. This can also be services. This can even be communication, activation and or packaging. To give you a very concrete example in the FMCG world, in the product uh, innovation uh, context, uh, is this one, the one from Doritos. So Doritos in Mexico had as a challenge or as an insight uh, or as a uh, business strategy that they had to reconnect with Gen Z. Their main insight was all around being adventurous and reconnecting with your friends and being exciting. But if you look at the snacking category and you think about words like adventurous, we all know that besides taste and flavor and maybe texture, it's not that adventurous. Um, so that was the challenge uh, for the ICA community and they had to come up with new ideas to bring that to life. And one of the ideas and the one you can see on the screen, uh, the blue back is a literal idea from the ICA crowd. This idea was to create a bag of chips, a bag of Doritos and have one or a few chips in there filled with squid ink. So a bit Russian roulette style, um, if you buy it in that chip, your tongue would turn blue, but all the other chips were just normal ones, meaning that it creates a bit of an excitement around who's gonna get it whenever you were eating this together with your friends. 
This was a literal ICA example. And Doritos brought this to the market exactly uh, as the idea was. Of course, they changed the packaging idea and so on a bit, but they really used the idea, brought it to market in Mexico, which was a huge success amongst the, uh, the target group they were trying to reach. But the idea was also a springboard to other product ideas. So yes, the starting point was that blue tongue, but afterwards they used that roulette idea, creating that adventurous feeling by also developing products where, for example, one or two chips were extremely spicy. But again, um, keep, uh, they kept innovating on that same start idea. Just to give you a very concrete example. Remember um, the 39 days that Erica was talking about. Why can we as larger organizations or our clients, why can they not deliver a new product to the market in 39 days? Too often do I get briefings or do I work on projects where we say, ah, oh, great product, launch it to market, and that they then say, yeah, in two years from now, it will be on the shelves. That happens still too much. And, and why is that? Why is that? Um, one of the main reasons that we say, uh, what we see is what we call uh, the traffic light syndrome. The traffic light syndrome, where you spend a lot of time in the fuzzy front end, so really lots of time and effort to build that inside and write that concept and, and uh, trying to get that perfect. And all the way at the end of the process, often the CEO asks for some numbers and says, we need to get a green light on these KPIs. And if it doesn't pass it, um, we're not gonna do it or you have to go back to start. Often that is exactly what happens. You spend all that time and it only gets validated at the end. It gets the orange or the red light and you have to go back to start. Often one of the main reasons why a concept gets killed, and Erica already touched upon that, is already because the insight was not good. So you have to go back to start just because you didn't work with the right insight. So all that money, all that effort, all that time was for nothing. What we believe in, and I know this is a bit of a crazy visual, but we believe a bit more in a straight road with a bobsled, a very fast bobsled, um, and multiple smaller uh, stoplights along the way. So Erica already mentioned the inside screening, so that's one, but also throughout the ideation phase, we believe in a much more iterative approach together with consumers to make sure that we're on the right track and that we're developing the right idea. So many more small checks and a more iterative approach, and of course not in the traditional way of working, where each time you set up an ad hoc project, because that would just double our innovation flow rather than um, reducing the time. So it's about a continuous iterative approach rather than setting up research after research after research to try to get to that perfect concept. To give you a case study uh, on this one, um, a project we did for CPUK in 2018, um, they briefed us saying, look, last year, 2017, we did an innovation flow. It took us 12 months. Uh, we wanted to end up with 30 concepts and we put them in a concept validation at the end. So that's what they did the year before we were involved. And they ended up out of those 30 concepts with five concepts that passed the test. So 25 that didn't, 25 concepts that took a lot of effort and money to develop that didn't pass the test. On top of that, five of those concepts, or out of those five concepts, four were three-star ideas, one four-star idea, and zero five-star ideas. 2018, we were briefed onto the project, and we did things a little bit different. We started with really good consumer immersion, really understanding what the frictions were, what the aspirations were, and which um, issues and frictions people had an emotion about, um, about, uh, about solving it, so finding that passion. Next to that, we um, had some workshops, ideation workshops, also including those one percenters, and 250 ideas were generated. Typically, what would happen then is try to get to concepts and move forward and move forward and only at the end validate them. But what we did instead is in between day one of the workshop and day two of the workshop, overnight, we screened 137 ideas together with consumers with which we were continuously connecting. So with those consumers, we screened, and you can see it on the screen a bit, Tinder style, swipe left, swipe right, uh, the 137 ideas, and day two of the workshop, we started working with that prioritized list rather than just keep working with the ones that we think are best. 
And doing so, and by working much more in an iterative way and, and involving consumers more uh, throughout the process, we were not able um, to reduce the total journey uh, by half, so six months instead of 12. But out of the 30 ideas uh, tested this year in 2018, we had 13 ideas that passed the validation phase. But maybe more importantly is that five ideas scored three stars, seven had their four star uh, ranking, and one idea even reached a five star uh, level, something that hadn't happened to CPUK in a very long time. So that is all about passion. Passion is really about one, making sure that your people are passionate about solving that friction and that it, the friction is protected uh, throughout the journey, but also involving the right people at the right stages in the innovation fun funnel. The final chapter that I wanna talk you through is pilot. And pilot is all about this example. And I'm pretty sure not a lot of people recognize this product. This product is a Microsoft Zoom. And the Microsoft Zoom was meant to be the Apple iPod uh, competitor. Unfortunately, it didn't really succeed. Was it because of the product? No, it was a pretty good product. It had good user, uh, user usability. It looked good. It worked good. Like the product specifications were great. It had everything to compete with the Apple iPod. The only problem was it was launched too late, five years after the iPod. And the main reason, uh, as Robbie Bach from Microsoft says it, we were we just weren't brave enough. We were trying to get to that perfect product before we dared to launch it into the market. And by then, Apple had such a first mover uh, advantage on the iPod that we were just too late. And like Winston Churchill already said it, perfection is the enemy of progress. And that is something we see so often happening uh, in bigger organizations. They wait until that final validation and it has to be green on all KPIs, otherwise we're not going to launch. What we would um, urge you to do is sometimes it's okay to walk through the orange light. We're not telling you to just cross the street without looking, no, do it cautiously, still look left and right, but sometimes it's fine to proceed with an orange light and dare to bring something to market, dare to pilot something. And the main differentiator again, and I, I, we will keep making that difference between startups and bigger organizations, is that startups often work with a go-to-market as being part of their innovation funnel. They dare to put a product on the market that is maybe not perfect yet. And along the way, optimize both the product as well as its positioning, as well as the packaging, communication, and so on. Of course, not with a full rollout uh, nationwide or, or, or globally. No, they do this in a smaller scale, in one shop, or in one store, or in one region, or even just amongst their friends. That's what a startup would do. What a big organization can do is, of course, something similar. You can choose one market, a market that is maybe less visible uh, globally, but is still big enough in terms of volume. You can maybe choose a few supermarkets uh, or a few stores and, and try things out and see how things go. But you can also do this in a more closed environment if you don't want competitors to get a leading edge and, and see what you're doing. Uh, and that is exactly what we did for PepsiCo. For PepsiCo, they had this product, Drinkfinity, already on the market in Brazil, and they wanted to launch it into the US market. The product adds some flavor to water to make water a bit more exciting to drink and make sure that you keep hydrated. So they wanted to see, one, is the product good? Is this a good innovation for this market? Or do we still have to optimize it? But two, also, how do we position it? How do we price it? How do we communicate about it? And they wanted to do that in a more secure environment. So what they did is they uh, involved 3,000 of their employees. So they have 60,000 employees, but they involved 3,000 of their employees to test this product. Everyone got a, a starter pack. And for a couple of weeks, people could try the product and had to fill out some surveys, had to participate in some activities, showing how the product worked, what they liked, disliked, and so on. Next to that, after they finished their starter pack, they could also buy products themselves on an online market space where only they had access to, to see whether they would also put their own money in, to see if the product actually had repurchase potential. So throughout that process of a few weeks, we were able to, within that group of 3,000 people, really test the product to the max in a real live occasion at the people's homes um, while getting feedback on positioning, communication, pricing, and so on before fully launching it into the market. But really seeing that piloting as part of the innovation funnel. 
Obviously, when you pilot, sometimes things will also go wrong and you will learn that a product is maybe not the right product to launch. And that is exactly what happened in a project uh, we did for Fleur. Fleur is a, is a manufacturer of devices that can detect heat and heat loss. And they developed a product that you could plug into your phone and therefore you could walk around your house and see whether there were any heat losses uh, in devices, but also in walls and so on and so on. They were mainly focused on the B2B market, but they were exploring whether there was an opportunity to go B2C as well with this product. And in concept tests, everything seemed quite all right. Everything seemed good. People were excited about the idea, wanted to try it and so on. But whenever we piloted this, again, in a bit more of a secure environment, we piloted this product and um, people indeed loved it the first day. They were walking throughout their whole house, checking all the devices, checking all the walls. But what we saw on the third and the fourth day was that most people already forgot where that product was. Most people literally even said, I don't see the point anymore. I've literally checked my whole house. What else is there to check? Of course, if you're not a tradie and if you're just living in your own home, yeah, what is there to check once you've seen everything? There is no reuse value for people. There's no relevance. So based on this pilot, this company actually decided not to go for the B2C market, while their concept test kind of gave them the feeling that they could have. And that brings me to my next point. Failing is part of innovation. If you know that 50% of the products that are brought to market, I'm not talking about concepts being killed, but products that are brought to market on average fail, 50% fail. That means that you as a company, if you really want to be good at innovation, if you want to dare to put things to the market and dare to pilot, you have to embrace that philosophy. You have to embrace the fact that you will fail from time to time. And a company that is actually even proud of all the failures is Google. And I think we can all agree that Google is one of the bigger innovators uh, in, in, in the market today. Um, they even have this website, the graveyard killed by Google, where they showcase all products and services that they've killed over the years. And they even explain why. And the last ones are even from this month. So if you go to their website right now, you will find even services and products that were killed uh, only just a couple of days and weeks ago. So that was it for pilot. The main message that we want to bring in terms of pilot is really see that go to market as part of the innovation funnel rather than saying we have our validated concepts. Now it's up to the marketing and the salespeople to make sure it works. No, once the product is in the market or the service is in the market, that is actually where the innovation really begins, where you can still optimize and still improve the product along the way. I'm going to slide to the right again and let Erica wrap up the story. Thanks, Jen. I think that was super interesting. So what we've been focused on today is really trying to think how can large incumbents, large companies act like uh, the guys that are doing a lot of fast innovation, the disruptors out there in the market. We think there's three, th three things about disruptors DNA that you, we need to think about. One is really building an insight through immersion with the customer or the, in the location, potentially even belong beyond where your service occurs or your product occurs. Really shape the insights, be focused on them and think about once you have a strong insight, how do you activate that internally? How can we make sure the whole company understands what our insight is about so they can help work along with us and help us get creative? And then, as Stan said, it's all about passion. It's about now we have our insight, we've tested it, we know it's strong. Passion in the ideation, selecting the right ideas, bringing in processes to get out of the box ideas. Don't just stay within the company. And then really optimizing and testing con concepts. And finally, it's perpetual beta. It's, it's having the confidence to get out there and test it. Don't launch a perfect product, but find a way to go to market fast, fail and fix it, or fail and fail it. But if, if large companies can think about these three key areas, we feel that they would be able to bring a lot more of this incumbent DNA, this um, innovation DNA into their company and try and launch products with more success faster. So we hope you found that interesting and stimulating. I really hope there's some ideas in here that you think you can take away and use because we know that in this country we really, really need it. 
So um, steal and pinch well, adopt what you think works. If you've got any questions, we'd love to hear them. You can post them now in the link to the webinar or you can send them to us afterwards. So thanks for joining us. It's been really fun to share this thinking with you. Um, everybody who joined us will be sending you a copy of the webinar so you'll be able to share it with your colleagues. We've also got a book scene where we summarise the thinking. So if this has stimulated a great idea for you, please um, get in touch, come and talk to us. It's something we're very passionate about. It's something we're really experienced about and it's something we'd really love to join with you so that you can be more successful because we know we need it. So thanks a lot, have a great afternoon and see you later. Thank mm -hmm. you.